It's a duel between sweets and meat. So grill the meat, but don't burn the duel. Hello everyone and welcome to Dueling with Dalton. And thank you for joining me as we talk about episode 46 of the Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s anime series. A hot and fiery episode in where the emotions are sweet. Although Goha 66 left a disappointing aftertaste. So we're better to start than their interactions with Goha 66 and the Machine Cavalry Club. Honestly, I was disappointed, as so far this group has been built up with a lot of mystery and a bit of sinister vibe within their actions. However, within this episode, they came across as highly comedic, but in a slightly cringy way. Now, I do want to believe that this was just an act staged by Goha 66 in order to lure our heroes into a false sense of security. Or this group simply has a condition slash code in where they cannot act hostile towards kids, despite their jealous feelings and their threat of dueling the Machine Cavalry Club. After all, they didn't do anything antagonistic towards Hunt after Hunt helped them find what it was they were looking for. And we also know as an audience that Goha 66 as Vendetta is aimed towards Goha themselves specifically. Now that line about youth will never understand a salaryman's romanticisms makes me think that Goha 66 members are just really upset and salty about being overworked and underpaid, whether that was while they were working within Goha or at their current job they are at the moment, of course being employed by Goha Corporation. So I am still holding out hope that 66 might actually still be a threatening group when they aim their focus towards Goha and not towards Yuga, Asana, the Machine Cavalry Club or anyone else of that sort of nature. They do seem like sensible people in the terms of deleting any trace of their organisation within the Goha systems and their other actions so far has left us as an audience speculating that they could actually be a real threat so there is still a small line of hope for them. However, my feelings about this group have definitely changed after watching this particular episode. However, one thing that has not changed is of course, Tiger. This character continues to be brilliant and her entrance within this episode was amazing. I really did love the voice acting that was used for her appearance and the chemistry she has with Asana was different than what I expected, but in a good positive way. I like the fact that there seems to be a hint of a rivalry between the two of them although there is clearly still a respect between the, the two of them. Now, there is still tension lingering in the air between Asana and Tiger, so I would like to see how that is going to unfold and unravel and kind of be built upon within future episodes, so let's learn more about those two characters and see where that takes us in the future. Plus, there seems to be a bit of tension between Caterpillio and Galleon, which makes sense when you consider the fact that each Cavalry Machine Club member prides themselves on serving and assisting Asana in every way possible. Still though, I thought that was a bit of cool character building slash interaction between those two and it does expand the characters of Caterpillio and um, Garlean, just giving them a bit more personality and a bit more substance as characters. So then the duel between Nikiyagi and Sweet Kakako I thought was really fun and entertaining. I really did like Nikiyagi's playstyle in where he raised his opponent's attack power and even changing their attributes, combining with himself having pirate beast monsters within his graveyard in order to destroy his opponent's monsters who obviously have the 2500 attack point or over value, thanks to his ace monsters effect. Seeing that most of the monster cards resemble older monsters within the Yu-Gi-Oh franchise, but with a barbecue twist, felt nostalgic. However, something about seeing Battlelox holding meat on a stick, or skewers as the technical term in barbecuing, felt a bit unsettling. Nevertheless though, poor Battlelox, because you get the idea. The whole encounter with Sweet Kakako felt slightly strange. In fact, she did slip up at one point and stated her affiliation with 66, when no one else even sort of made the connection. The fact that no one also mentioned Finger Chikako, yet she still stated to not know any Sorako or Chikako, 
also raised a few flags about their kind of whole personality and gimmick as a character. Plus, she immediately left the show after losing, being replaced with Flush, a new look-alike character that follows the same design as all the other um, Sorakos, Shushikakos, and Kokoko. You get the idea. So with Menzaboro and Nikiyagi both falling in love with the Sorako girls, uh, girls, hopefully this doesn't mean Sushiko is next to fall in love with one of their kind or get infatuated by them, giving a reason for Team Menzaboro to switch to the enemy sides in hopes of freeing these poor food-related characters. I was really surprised to see Roman actually join Rook in eating all of the stone hench made out of sweets, but I guess her sweet tooth and hunger outweighed her desire to scold Rook for acting like a silly fool yet again. Now I did love the stuff between Roa and Neil. Their interaction was really funny, entertaining and just helped to kind of show the dynamic between the two characters. That friendly banter between them was entertaining, but what was more intriguing was the ending itself, finding that sign within the ramen shop and it linking to Otis. The owner not responding as well created a lot of questions that need to be cleared up and answered within the next few episodes. And one of the questions created was, is Otis the ramen man? Or is the ramen man Otis? I think not, honestly, because I think that would be a little bit too silly even for Sevens's kind of way of doing stuff. Plus, now with that idea in everybody's mind after watching this episode, it seems a little bit too predictable, but would be a pretty cool twist nevertheless. Now at the same time, this whole idea of the ramen man being Otis just reminds me of the kind of weird wacky fan theory that everyone had when Naruto was at its peak. Because everyone was saying that Tobi from Naruto was actually the Ichiraku ramen man that always served ramen to Naruto. But of course, we learned that that was not true and it turned out to be Orbito, but it was still a funny theory that kept going round. Overall though, this was a really fun episode and I can't wait to see what the next episode entails as we get more of an explanation behind the ramen man and what his affiliation with Otis could possibly be and we get to learn about why Gakuto is within a James Bond reference. Well, that's what it looks like at the moment. So hopefully they kind of expand on that a little bit too as we also get to see Ushio and Geta once again betraying our heroes and going towards the side of evil. But yeah, the next episode looks packed, looks like it's going to be a fun one, so let's hope and see where that one takes us with the story and plot. But of course, let me know your thoughts about this particular episode in the comment section down below, and I do hope you've enjoyed this review. If you have, hit that like button and subscribe for more Yu-Gi-Oh! content. But above all else, I do hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Aligato, matane, goodbye.